everybody. Welcome to the ABA Inside Track Book Club special preview for our main feed. For those of you who are new to ABA Inside Track, we're a podcast where we discuss behavior analytic research. But once a season, for our very special Patreon subscribers, we do a full-length book club discussion. This is our summer 2022 book club. We'll be discussing the book Street Data by Dr. Shane Safir and Dr. Jamila Dugan. This is a preview of that recording where we talk a little bit about our feelings about the book and just kind of give you a, a bit of information about the, the book itself. If this is something that you would like to hear the rest of, we would very much love it if you came over to our Patreon page and subscribed at our premium $10 level. By doing that, you're able to get the full episode as well as two CEs for this episode at no additional charge, as well as other bonuses, including discounts on all CE purchases and access to all of the book clubs that we have done in the past, not just this one, but all of our previous book clubs. So we love you to take a listen. And if you like what you hear, please think about subscribing. But anyway, here is the beginning of our discussion of Street Data. Hey, everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Tracks Book Club for summer 2022. I'm your host, Rob Perry Cruz. And with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hi, it's me, Jackie. You sang so long, your mic cut out. Yeah. And it's me, Diana. Hello. And it's me, Alan, the book club guy. <laughs> Good. I was waiting. Book club guy, <laughs> Alan. Alan. <laughs> That's right. We've got, we've got the fearsome foursome here because this is our uh, patron-only uh, book club for the summer months. At some point, I think you might hear this on our free feed, but that's way in the future. This is only for you special folks who subscribe at our $10 and up level. We are discussing a full length book right here, right now. And Diana, what is that book that we will be discussing today? Oh my goodness. Well, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> it's like, got a, got a vamp. We don't what? remember. <laughs> Read that book, guys, quick. Well, uh, First of all, I just want you to know that I prepared for this by doing several different things. Okay. First of all, I read Street Gang, okay. but it turned out that that was all about the history of Sesame Street. Not what we're doing tonight. Right. Then I listened to all of the albums that we owned by the streets. Okay. But it turns out that that's like a British rap band from the early 2010s. It's not. It's just one guy. It's just one guy. It's just Mike. It's just one guy. What was that? What was that? Grand Hook on for free. That's, that's an that's amazing right. album. So I did that. And then I went back and I watched a lot of community episodes because I really wanted to be streets ahead. Okay. But none of those were actually related. It just left you streets behind. To this book because this book is called Street Data. Did you play any video games while you were preparing for this, Diana? Uh, I did. I played a little bit of GTA. I, I was assuming you say Street Fighter. Oh, and Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We didn't plan that one. Okay. But no, no, no. It turned out this book was related to absolutely none of those topics. It was called Street Data. A next generation model for equity pedagogy. Gogy? Pedagog. Pedag I'd say pedagogy. pedagogy. And school transformation by Shane Safir and Jamila D Dugan. And uh, yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, excellent. So uh, the theme for this month, and, and then this book was voted on by our patrons, was equity, the idea of equity. So we had uh, How to Be Anti Racist by Ibramix Candy. We had White Fragility. Uh, by, I, I want to say D'Angelo, I'm forgetting uh, her Robin. name. Robin. Yeah, Robin D'Angelo. And then Street Data, which was a book that I had found when, honestly, I was like, what's a good book that's probably somewhat behavior analytic, that has to do with data, uh, that has to do with equity, and I need a third one. And this one came up, and so I sort of shortlisted it on our Amazon list. And then I had a fellow, a colleague, a, a consulting a psychiatrist to the district I work in, who said, oh, Rob, you're going to love this book, Street Data. I recommend it. I know you're going to love it. And she's known me for a number of years. So if she says she thinks I'm going to love a book, I, I assume that she's, you know, not just like making it up. And so I was like, all right, well, that one's definitely on the list. So that was one of our, our three books. And she said, it won the don't poll. take my word for it. It was, yeah, it was LeVar Burton, consulting psychiatrist. And that is how we've come to talk about street data. Because, you know, certainly it, it has equity in the title. We're behavior analysts, so we're all about data. So it seems like it's going to be a match made in heaven, right? Well... Stay tuned, folks. We have to talk about the book to decide if that is the case. Um, I don't, I don't, there's not a lot of like really exciting background because this is a very recent book. It was released last spring in March 2021. 
And I believe the authors have Jackie. Did, did one of the authors, Shane, had you written Dr. Uh, Safir? Had she written any books before? I, I think we were mentioning. Yes, she has written a book before. And that's one of my pet peeves when somebody writes a book and then they frequently cite their previous book, like in a book that I wrote already. What was it called? The Active Listener? The le- Leader, li- Listening Leader. Listening Leader. She mentions it one times. In How many times book. you cut out? You cut out, Jackie. How many times? Oh, was it? One million. One million. Wow. I actually counted. It's like twenty-four times. Okay, I thought it was three. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have our two authors. Uh, but before we get into kind of a little bit of background on the book, and then start talking about the book, um, just initial thoughts uh, going into the book, and initial thoughts as you were reading the book. Uh, uh, Alan, would you like to? Why don't you start us off, Alan? Like, what, what were you kind of thinking when when you found out this was going to be the book club book? Well, I was somewhat familiar with the book just Mm -hmm. from keeping my pulse on the things. And I have to say, overall, the message of the book is very, like, good. It's very current. Mm -hmm. It's like the opening opening sort of, like, shots fired. They talk about settler colonialism and a lot of the issues that are very prescient right now. But it also sort of feels like this is a conversation that's been going on since, like, No Child Left Behind was enacted. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of, it's nice that it repeats old arguments and puts it within a new context, but it also does repeat a lot of old arguments. So I was kind of conflicted about what the utility of this book, um, as I sort of got into it, hopeful, but... And again, it has its place, but I think from a behavior analyst point of view, it's something I've heard a lot about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very curious to see kind of what everyone's take, because Alan, you, you and I both have uh, a history working in public schools, and then uh, and then as behavior analysts as well, whereas Jackie and Diana, you are more about the behavior analysis with some knowledge of public schools. So I'm curious to see if we had different takeaways from the book from the perspective of an educator, an educator who's a behavior analyst, a behavior analyst who knows about education. I'm kind of curious to see if we're coming up with some different messages or take-homes at the end of it. Yeah. Um, and Alan, I'm going to say right now, if it's something that is information you already know, like Diana says, you're always streets ahead on this stuff. So it may be important that people you know who are streets behind get this information. Because when you, you, you we're just, just I, you know stationary on street, yeah, we're we're just hanging out. We're loiter. We're street loiterers. <laughs> Your streets ahead on this stuff. And I, I think this will be an interesting conversation because we are all educators, but we're educators in different ways, right? So Alan, you and Rob both have a background specifically in education, and Jackie and I do not, but we're currently educators at the graduate school level. So for me, there were interesting takeaways from this that could be applied in that setting. And that may or may not have been the um, point of the book, Mm -hmm. which I guess we'll come to. Sure. Jackie, how about you? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I found it hard to figure out who the book was written Mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. So I kept, as I'm reading it, I kept like ripping hats off and putting hats on. Like, am I reading this <laughs> as a behavior? Like, how would I read this just as a behavior analyst? How would this apply just to me? How am I reading this as a professor? How would I read this as like a school administrator? How would I read this as the teacher? What could I do at each of these things? So I think that for me was a little confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was hard for me to kind of follow my own path. <laughs> like here are my main take- takeaways, right? Because I kept feeling that I was like ripping my hats off and, 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 and switching them up. Um, so I think, I think again, I, the, the information I think is needed. I, I do think we need some change in our, in our public education system. Right. But I think it would have been a little helpful to be like, if you're a teacher here, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. If you're an administrator here, I love books that do that. And I was looking for that. And Maybe I would have found it more if I dove and spent more time in those discussion questions, but I don't know because some of them didn't feel like, as a behavior analyst, I'm writing this as a public school behavior analyst, I was pretending to be one, right? What what could I do at this level? And sometimes I felt like not much, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm not in the position to make change. Yeah. Right. 
Diana, I know you, you mentioned a little bit in terms of your own perspective as a behavior analyst who has come into education at a different level than the kind of target audience of this book. But did you have any other kind of thoughts going in when you started reading it, while you were reading it? I think that the book comes in very strong, right? And I could tell that the authors are very excited at the beginning of the book to get out all of those points that they wanted to make. And I think I've, I've done maybe enough reading in this area that I wasn't shocked or surprised by the points that were being brought up. But like Alan said, they are very new and prescient points the way that she's presenting them. And if I had never read that before, those initial chapters may have been, you know, really uh, transformative in one's thinking, right? Mm-hmm. You When you encounter that book, that's the one that you're like, Oh, I haven't thought about it this way before, right? Like that, that becomes one of your favorite books, right? Mm-hmm. So I could see for someone who hasn't read that yet, like the first few chapters of this book could be one of your favorite books, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I thought that it started really strong. And if I maybe hadn't had the background, I would have been like really blown away <laughs> by some of it. And then as we went on, I was like, yep, I got it. I am good on the points that you're making. I, I, I got where this is going and I think I've arrived there with the authors. Mm-hmm. So for me, the the bang for your buck is definitely in the first chapters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I would say one thing I also I appreciate about the book, both behavior analytically and in how the book was written is they gave us some like points, like here are the things you could do. It's like at the last chapter, I think like here are the things that you need to do. Stay focused. Right. These are things that we as behavior analysts would agree with most of the time. Right. Use salient cues. Make sure that the consequences are in place and you have relevant stimulus control. Right. Promote uh, collaboration with the people that are doing it. Right. So when they're talking about the administration and the teachers, like don't just say this is something else you have to do. But, you know, get that buy in, make it a learning opportunity where reinforcement is inherently present. Right. And then I think that they did that throughout the book. Right. So they they. I think they use so many visuals that maybe some of the visuals weren't necessary. Oh, I love the um, visuals though. But I love the visuals, yeah. <laughs> right? So I thought that they presented a, like if you're you don't love words, right? And you like to see things in a visual but way. But you I find thought, yourself reading a book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this looks it's pretty textbooky, right? Yeah, so there's a glossary, right. right, which I also loved. I love myself a good glossary. I think it grounds everyone. I wish the glossary was always in the beginning, to be honest. I wish all books had glossaries in the beginning so I could Mm -hmm. understand what everyone's thinking first and then dive into the book. Um, But so I think, you know, I I loved that they had those visuals there. I thought it really tied together their their points. I liked the uh, worksheets that they had in there. You know, they're like, here's what we're talking about. Here are the worksheets. What I wish they would have done one step further is like, here's an application, right? That's something that I, I would have loved to see a little bit more of. They kind of did those with the case studies in vignette, yeah. but I would have liked more of those after they said, here's what you're doing. Here's how you can collect street data. Here's a worksheet. Now here's an exact example, right? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree there, Jackie. It, it definitely, there wasn't any one chapter where I was left feeling like, I don't know what they're talking about in this chapter. Like, yeah. I always felt like, oh, I get it. And I kind of have an idea of what this would look like in practice. Some chapters better than others actually giving you the anecdotes or giving you yeah. the scripted conversations. There are actually a couple of good, like, videos and links yeah. on here. Yes, but as, there are video links, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. but as, as a whole, I, I agree. I kind of felt like this was the sort of book that if you just read it thinking, and now I'm ready to help my team use street data – you're still missing some pieces or you're uh, jumping into, and maybe that's kind of, that's part of what the book's saying. You're jumping into a complex situation rather than a complicated situation in which you don't know the outcome. But I also felt like not only do I not know the outcome, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm going to be using these tools correctly. Um, And depending on your team makeup, the diversity of your team, uh, you, you may be stuck falling into some of the traps and tropes of uh, inequitable teacher behavior uh, when you think you're doing everything correct for equity, when in reality, all you're doing is sort of going about the problem with slightly different vocabulary, but in the same inherently biased and racist, white supremacist, you know, educational lens that we have here in America. 
So I, I, there was a little more I wanted. I almost felt like I wanted there to be more, more workbook activities or more guided practice activities to jump on because the book sets itself up as different sections, you know, section one, really talking about the idea of street data and equity section two, getting into more of what is street data section three, then kind of jumps into here's some ways you can use reflection as a teacher. And then section four is a little bit more administrative, but not exactly. And it, it doesn't quite give me everything I want to feel like, all right, and implement, which, you know, uh, it's not necessarily fair to, to make the authors, you know, change my whole district with their one book. Um, I've, the the format, which – and this is, I think, a, a positive, of, especially if you were reading it in conjunction, like in a class, would be the um, the nurture effect. It has that same setup of like this could be ma- like useful mm-hmm. to people that are learning this content and learning the context of all of this. So that is a bonus. And I think that the, what I disliked about – the nurture effect this book really makes up for in terms of like talking about like the current situation, not sort of like this is the state of behaviorism and behavioral science from the last 30 years and what we can do about it. This one felt mm-hmm. very specific to some of the problems we're seeing in schools now. Mm-hmm. I think, and if you really liked those early chapters that do in- talk about sort of the context of you know, like we live in a system that has some very awful biases toward large groups, uh, large uh, portions of the population. Yeah. Um, it reminded me a lot of there's a great book called Two Dollars a Day by Luke Schaefer and Catherine Eden, where they look at like sort of vignettes of people that were really adversely affected by changes to the welfare system mm-hmm. post Reagan under Reagan Clinton. And to some extent, um, President George W. Bush. And I, I, that lots of different portions of this book sort of took me there of like, so that was the welfare system and the changes that were made and how it affected these families. And look at those changes that were made to the public school system and how they have really tanked us in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and underserved Mm -hmm. these families. So I think that in sort of, Take if you wanted sort of a broader reading, this book fits nicely into a uh, sort of a spectrum between those other two books. Mm-hmm. Alan, you've always got good book references. I need to stop reading, trying to catch up on my Star Wars canon novels, and and really uh, go beyond, go beyond a little more, or Disney, or Disney nonfiction. I got a lot of those. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, really quickly about the authors, then we're going to get into the book of the book itself. We'll talk a little bit about some of the early chapters, probably in more depth, and then we'll be a little lighter as we get to the sort of part where, honestly, if you're not actively practicing this book, you can read it, you'll get some ideas. But if it's a book, you're like, I'll just read this and I'll know all about equitable data. You probably won't know it any more than if you're like, I'm in the self-reflection stage of bias. Like, that's great. That's an important stage. But if that's all you ever do... You ain't doing anything to support equity work uh, long term. You know, you, you got a couple of days. You can you can coast on that. Oh, okay. So we've got two authors, uh, Dr. Shane Safir and Dr. Jamila uh, Dugan. And uh, Dr. Safir is, because I think, the primary author. They sort of broke down who wrote what chapter, and she wrote, I guess, more chapters. Uh, but they're both co-authors on the book. Uh, she had a background in history. And then went into education and then sort of went into more of the administrative role. She worked in uh, the California school system and specifically, I think, the uh, the San Francisco's June Jordan School for Equity, which uh, from her bio is a cutting edge national model, uh, which was quoted as having beaten the odds and supporting the success of low income students of color. So she's had multiple years as an administrator in a school uh, which was focusing on equitable behavior. Uh, she wrote another book, I think. Jackie, is that right? You were saying something about it. Maybe she mentions it once, twice. She sure does. <laughs> the Listening Leader, Creating the Conditions for Equitable School Transformation. Yes. And uh, she does give you enough information in the book about what you could learn from the listening leader, which is more about the idea of building kind of relational capital with others and then listening. So some of the later chapters, I think, really are pulling from that work that she'd done. That's where I I think it was most heavily cited. 
Yes. In those later chapters. Yeah, Alan. One second. If you wanted, I, I think if you wanted to be generous about her mentioning it, you could, I think she may also be avoiding some self plagiarism. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. In that she's really drawing, like she's sort of wrapping up this book and saying, I've kind of been making these points. And oh, yeah. I really, you know, um, just because I did scan the other book and she does talk about it to some extent. So mm -hmm. not, not to slap it down, she does, she does mention it an awful lot. <laughs> but just as a credit that, you know, good not to self-plagiarize. That's true. That is That's true. true. But it also feels a little weird when you're like, read this book and this book and this book and this book that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, Street Data sort of came about by taking a lot of the practices from the administrative history and from her consulting and to, uh, you know, it kind of became like a pandemic, right? It, it seemed like she talks a little about in the preface as taking those ideas and putting them into this book. And our other author, Dr. Jamila Duggan, uh, at, is, uh, is a teacher and professional of color who had a bad history in the public school system. So many of the inequitable practices that are written about in this book in terms of speaking to everyone achieving and then acting like students of color probably won't achieve, you know, there's that subtext. That was her learning experience as a young student to the point that she actually was expelled from school uh, because the school just was not providing her what was needed. And we're seeing a lot of her behavior as being, you know, inappropriate. Uh, I kind of reading between the lines in, in some of her bio. Uh, and then she went to a different school. It was a Pan-African school that focused on identity development and education for Black liberation, which she said really turned her whole educational framework around and then led to her work as a teacher in Washington, D.C., where she was nominated for Teacher of the Year one year, where she worked on implementing uh, back international baccalaureate programs, uh, uh, Mandarin immersion when she moved out to California to be a teacher and administrator out there. Uh, and, it, and now at this point, she, I think, does more kind of that similar idea of she's working more as kind of a consultant and a leader rather than working directly in schools, I believe. And she was the primary researcher on the listening leader. So I'm guessing when she moved out to California, that's when her and Dr. Safir, Dr. Dugan and Dr. Safir kind of got together. They worked on the listening leader a little bit to get, uh, to some extent together. It's, it's a little unclear. She was a primary researcher is all I could find. And then you know, led to the creation of their co-authoring of Street Data. Uh, so she, and I, yeah, and I just have to say that Dr. Dugan or Duggan, I wasn't quite entirely sure. I, don't I didn't know. get a chance to look it up. Her sections, I felt, were much more sort of to the point in a very helpful way. Again, Dr. Safer, I want to just be completely clear that what she contributes is really great in terms of just a framework and sort of thinking and trying to be concise about very difficult top topics, but. Dr. Dugan sections are like really hit home to sort of what I, um, my experience in public schools and the inequitable systems in place. Mm. Yeah, I'm wondering how much of that, Alan, I mean, how much of that, Alan, do you think might have been because Dr. Dugan spent more time as a teacher and had her, you know, had a learning history that was probably similar to many of the students she was teaching in the DC school systems versus Dr. Safir, who seems like she focused more on the administrative side of things and writes this book from more of that 10,000 mile uh, view to some extent of like, you have to learn these terms uh, and more of what she was talking about was sort of for like the white educator, less so than uh, necessarily educators of color um, just because of her own experience. Well, I, I would, I would just be rather succinct and say that Dr. Safer is trying to be, trying to use CRT in a way that like, this is what critical race theory looks like without mm -hmm. going on about it. Like these are important mm -hmm. ideas for shaping our understanding. And so, and she's rather upfront about that, which I think is both a plus of the book, but it also is that's, it's kind of frustrating because it's like, Oh, if only this had been like, 10 years earlier before we're sort of reacting to the mm. anti-CRT rather than like, you can tell that she's really trying to cut off the anti-CRT conversation and say, no, no, no. Like some of these ideas are very important to our understanding of the current school system, but it feels like we're a couple years too late mm. on, to some extent. Mm. Oh, and it could just be again that she doesn't have as much experience in schools. So, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely came from different backgrounds. and But I, I did I did appreciate that they broke out who wrote what chapter, because I think it did lend itself to... It was kind of fun 
I, I don't want I don't want to be dismissive of of the tone, but it was sort of fun to have two authors. And then there's one who wrote just one of the chapters was a, was a third author. They just had like a guest writer. Uh, it was nice to get a different voice. Like you know, you kind of get tired of like I'm reading the same shit, and then you got a different voice. And and they they didn't try to hide that, and they didn't try to change it. Like this definitely felt like a book that they worked on together. But when it was time to write, they were writing as themselves, which I I found very interesting for a book that otherwise, like Jackie said, was kind of textbook like in in many ways. You know, I I don't really know much about the public school system. So I didn't so if people are reading this, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like I wouldn't know that they were a couple years behind. Right? I'd be like, Oh, this is revolutionary because mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't you know, like I don't even have a kid in the public school system right now. Like if the public school system is foreign. It's just a place where there's schools, right? And I'm paying my taxes and people go to school. But I don't have any, like, I don't consult the public schools. And so when I'm, I'm reading this, so, like, other people will probably be, like, not know that this has already been discussed and already been talking about um, because this was, it was kind of new to me. Public schools are weird. And and, and maybe just for, for folks listening to this who, who also don't have a lot of experience with public schools, because it does seem like, oh, it's a big, you know, block of of, of topics. Right. And just like in behavior analysis, it's kind of, you know, you're a teacher, you gotta learn the same teacher stuff and then you go and then you teach and, and that's what you do. And even in a state like Massachusetts, you know, we're, you know, for, for at least three of us, we're Massachusetts, which fortunately always scores really, really high in education. But you would think that means then whenever you read something cutting edge, all of the Massachusetts schools must be doing it. And then even within our state, depending on what town you go to, they're going to have vastly different experience. And sometimes you're surprised. I know I've been surprised where I've heard about schools that I know are really low performing schools, schools that have done so badly that they've gone into receivership by the state. And I'll hear the teachers working there. They're using the cutting edge materials where I'll talk to a colleague who say in like an affluent, well off district who has never heard of half of these things because they haven't had to because the makeup of their population is such that I mean, honestly, equity hasn't been as much of a problem due to the demographics. And when I say hasn't been as much of a problem, I mean, it hasn't been a primary problem due to the number of students who are probably white and in high socioeconomic classes. I know that's not all of a district, but that's enough of it. It's majority of the district. So when we talk about a public school district, it's not a topic. Yeah, you've been presented. Yes, but your mileage may vary. And how those districts decide to tackle subjects like equity are going to be very different depending on the makeup of the population, how well they're doing on state tests. So it you could be in a, I think you could be in a district that you think is cutting edge. And this some of this may be relatively new material. Um, certainly if you're a behavior analyst, you may have never seen half of this material even working in public schools. Uh, and I also and that brings me to another important book, a point about why I pre- did what I did preach about this book. And that is that a lot of what they criticize in this book a decade, two decades ago was the cutting edge equitable approach that were, was intended to be. And I think that we as behavior analysts need to be aware because like we contributed to some of the systems that they criticize, like the curriculum based yeah. assessments structure. And I, I think that was another frustrating part. It's like, just blame us. Like, we need, like, like we're some of the experts <laughs> that contributed to these problems and that, like, scripted curriculums, uh, it's supposed to be equitable for, like, lower performing students or students that need more assistance and students with, um, you know, in the special education system. But uh, it's turned out not to be equitable because it's been poorly implemented and without mm-hmm. fidelity and it's been sort of taken over by administration and state political interests. So I think that's another important point is that what was equitable or seemed or was intended to be equitable was equitable within a system that equity couldn't really exist and we exacerbated problems. So Alan, you you you're you're speaking exactly that that was my thought process throughout this whole book. I felt like I would read a chapter and I would agree with everything in the chapter. And I would also disagree with half the things in the chapter. And I found myself, you know, at like a real crisis of, am I disagreeing because I think these ideas are wrong? Am I disagreeing because I think these ideas are wrong from the lens of a white male 
teacher or educator who's benefited from this system and hasn't finished their own self-reflection on the, you know, just the, the kind of the, the inherent racism in these systems. And how will I know the difference? So, so many of the topics brought up in this book, I was very much in support of. And then I find myself scared about the idea of implementation. And it was a lot to say, am I scared because I worry this won't work? Or am I scared because it's just not going to work within a context I have decided arbitrarily, which is every context to some extent, is not the right one because it's not the one I know. And am I just being very short sighted in that? So in in that regard, this book is, is you know, I mean, it, depending on who you are, if you're coming from a background like mine, I think it, it can be very hard to hear some of this. But I think we should take that as exciting. We should be excited that there are other ideas out there. And I think when you look at, say, like our ethical code, much of what's suggested in this book in terms of looking at learner strengths, looking at socially valid measurement systems is very in line with what we as behavior analysts should be doing rather than, no, this is the curriculum that is the best curriculum, ergo, it is the only curriculum. And if you're not doing well at it, it's because you are not doing, you are not a good student or you're failing rather than, well, there might be a reason that you're not engaged with this curriculum. And it might have to do with our structures, our racist structures. It might have to do with a different background that we're not taking into account. It might have to do with it's not of value to you as a learner, but you could learn the same material in a different way, learn the exact same material, but we just, we're not presenting it in that way. We're not giving you that choice or voice. Uh, so there, there, I, you know, I think there was a lot in here. I, I know I had a lot of fun reading this book, but again, I think if you're not at that point in your own educational idea, you could probably read this book and be very angry at the end of it, which would be sad. But, you know, again, you, everyone reads books differently, I guess. Well, I think that if you if your own personal experience has been one of academic success within the types of educational systems that we have established, then it can feel threatening for someone to say, well, those systems by which you've been measuring your success uh, may not be the best reflection, right? Or it's only a reflection if you have this particular history. And that's something you have to sit with and be able to expand upon, which you are you did, <laughs> Rob. So, uh, But I think it's, it's okay to recognize that within yourself and with your own personal lived experience. I also think that our our background as behavior analysts uh, can bring us into this conversation and kind of a threatened position as well, right? Because we have been taught to base our definitions of success or positive outcome, right? Or doing good, which is what we all want to be here to do is do good things uh, on these uh, same types of you know, really clear, observable, measurable outcomes. And that's not to say that those may not be important ways to measure, but we need to think about why we're measuring them in that way, who decided that that's how we're going to measure something, right? And guess what? It's often <laughs> the same group of people that benefit from that measurement system that, that devise that measurement system. And are there, you know, limitations or narrow perspectives of success that we are defining with that measurement system and can we look at other broader ways of measuring positive outcome that are potentially less objective mm -hmm. and more subjective instead so we as behavior analysts have to i think also kind of take that in right and not necessarily feel threatened by that but we as a field are at this pivotal moment of taking what we understand about objective measurement and also looking at the benefits of subjective measurement. So it's a good time for us as a field, I think, to be taking in a book like this. Mm. All I, right. I'm not gonna lie, I did feel a little threatened when she's like, you don't need that data. And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> but I love my data. Well, Jackie, and you and I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jackie. Sorry. Yeah, and we had this conversation before. I'm like, we can do them together, can't we? We can use these together. Like I was trying in my in my um, in my heart of hearts to like make a compromise, being like, I love data, I think it can be helpful, but I also think it's not the end all be all. But that's not really the point she's making. I think Rob was was right, because I was like, 
I was like, can't we, can't we do both? Can't we use street data? And then can't we use the assessment data, right, to guide our overall decisions? If we're using the street data to then inform our assessments, will mm-hmm. that then give us the data that can show global improvement, right? Because I don't want to just subjectively say everyone's doing much better, but then really no one's done better because everyone just feels better because we're talking about it more, but there's not actual behavioral change. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I, I think if the data that is that is currently being used, so we're looking at sort of our state assessments or our national assessments or sort of our worldwide math and science scores, if every year we show that all of our students were making huge improvements, regardless of demographic data, they, you know, there's, there's no, no difference. Everyone's improving every year. Everyone's in the top percentiles. Then this wouldn't be the conversation we would need to have. And then everyone's getting jobs and everyone's scoring high on QOL mm. questionnaires. Then it wouldn't really matter what data we were taking. The issue becomes that's not the case. And I think, you know, jumping into the preface of the book, you know, this is a pandemic, right? Uh, where the authors themselves were saying, my kids were starting to hate school and then pandemic. And I found that when they had new things to do that weren't just the same old, same old, they seemed to like school a little bit better. And really coming back to what, like like, like Alan said, is not a new idea, but mm-hmm. why do we have, why are educational systems the way they are? It's not because they were perfected in the late, in the early 1900s, and there's no need to change them. It's because they seemed to work pretty well for a lot of people in the early 1900s. Not for everybody, but they worked for the people who had the loudest voices then. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And at some point, we all have to sit back and say, I think some of this stuff is really broken. Mm-hmm. We need to do things differently. And why? What, what, what if one of the steps was let's stop looking at what she refers to as the satellite data? You know, it doesn't help us make decisions. It sort of just tells us how things are bad. And start looking at the causes of student success, student difficulties, student opinion on work, and use that information. That's kind of, you know, loosely some of that street data to uh, make better educational decisions. And there's a great quote I love in the preface. Uh, It's on page four. What is the purpose of education anyway? Do we teach and lead to simply reproduce reality or will we teach and lead to transform it? And, you know, it brings to mind, like, when you read about, like, oh, the people who learned to be doctors in the 1800s, they didn't have a great doctor curriculum in the 1800s. They just, like, do stuff and watch people. And I'm not saying that all of that behavior was totally ethical and appropriate, but there was a sense of we have to learn how this works. So let's do things that allow us to learn what we think is helpful uh, rather than here's your published curriculum. You have to follow it. There are pros and cons to having standardized curricula, but I think there's a time and a place for everything. Sort of like you were saying, Jackie, with that data we were talking about, I don't think either of these authors would say you can never use any of the data systems we've used in the past. I think the question would be more, why do you need to use those data systems particularly? And are they telling us information that is helping students with making choices for about their education that will benefit them for the rest of their lives? Well, and and I think... It's in the area of around page 52. She really talks about like listening to students and families, especially when their voices are hard to hear. And I think that goes back also to that feeling of being threatened at us as professionals and that we've spent a long time learning about these systems that are supposed to be helpful. And we're being told that, no, the data that you're making me take is intrusive It's not Mm. that useful. It doesn't guide me in a very practical way. It doesn't help me make the student lives better. But hey, here is types of data I can take. Some of the data that you, the data collection practices that you as professionals have handed to schools can be part of that. But like this is where teachers, people who have been expert, who have trained and worked for sometimes decades Mm -hmm. in these systems to say, hey, like my expertise says, this is useful data. So then it's on us to go back and be like, okay, so, all right, how do we, how can we help teachers and families and students use this data and take data 
in ways that you know meets our arbitrary standards or is closer to having a broader social validity if you if you like but yeah it's really on us to like to to turn it off (laughs) and listen and then be like okay because we're being asked to help with the book like this i think that that is sort of the tone it's just like listen (laughs) don't don't just keep don't just keep handing me curriculum based measurement Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. And scripted curricula. <laughs> yeah. Right. That doesn't help. We hope you enjoyed this special preview of our full length discussion of street data. If you want to hear how the rest of the conversation goes, learn more about the book itself and get two CEs, please head on over to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track and subscribe at the $10 and up level. Again, that'll give you access to the full episode as well as access to all of our previous book club episodes, as well as some other bonuses like the chance to vote on our next book club in the wintertime because our spring one, our, our fall one's already decided, unfortunately, because it's a supervision topic in the fall. And also to get episodes a week ahead of time, as well as bonuses for all CE purchases. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed our special Street Data Book Club preview. But until next time, keep responding. Bye. 